Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. Got Stacy and the boys with me. Shalom. Hello. Hey everybody. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about Enoch's 364 day calendar. Okay. I believe the Lord has finally, finally allowed us to figure out why Enoch said there was a 364 day calendar. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be interesting to find out because I know you've done a lot of research on it. So, uh, yeah, let's hear what you get. I'm not the only one that did a lot of research. A lot of people around the world have been trying to figure out why Enoch said that there was a 364-day calendar. A uh, lot of which have been to try to discredit the scripture and a lot of which have been trying to prove it. I think the ones who are trying to prove that the scripture is accurate have been a little bit more quiet on the subject because we haven't been able to actually figure out why Enoch said there was a 364-day calendar. Yeah, every once in a while I wonder, how can there be a 364-day calendar when it's apparent when it seems like a 365-day calendar works? After this class, you're going to be sure why Enoch said that there was a 364-day calendar and its relationship to the 365-day calendar. Now, just so we're thorough on the subject, we're going to come over to parallel.thebookofenoch.info and look at three parallel versions of the Book of Enoch. Alright, when we come down to chapter 72, which is part of the book of the luminaries, we see that Enoch said that there was exactly 364 days in a year. We see it in all three translations. Right. He says the same thing over in chapter 74, that there are actually 364 days in a year. And in chapter 82, he says that there are 364 days in a year. So, did Enoch not know what he was talking about? No, not considering that he got it from straight from the angels and the Lord. We must be the ones that are out of sync. You're right, Chris. Like we read over in the book of Genesis, chapter 5 and verse 24, Enoch was not a regular dude. If you will, go ahead and read verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. See that part where it says that he walked with God? That means that he was actually walking with the Elohim. He was walking with the angels that actually taught him the book of the luminaries. And just like Moses, they dictated it to him, and he just wrote down what they said. Right. This would have been during the same time when you had those fallen angels that was down there teaching Cain's kids how to make war and such. But now, Enoch wasn't the only person that talked about a 364-day calendar. Moses talked about his 364-day calendar as well. And I may have given the answer already, but what did Moses and Enoch have in common? They had talked directly with angels. Yeah, the information that they wrote down in their books was dictated to them. It wasn't like it was passed down from their forefathers or anything like that. They actually was face-to-face with these angels that gave them the information that they were supposed to write down. That's how the scripture is so accurate. So were they the only ones that received one-on-one uh, -on -one dictations from the angels? Probably not, but they are the only ones in which the scripture says so. John would have heard directly from angels in the book of Revelation. I'm sure a lot of the prophets were hearing directly from the Elohim. Right. But the thing about the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch is it says it plainly that they were getting their information from the Elohim. But anyway, let's come over to Jubilees chapter 6 and verse 32. This is Moses talking about the 364 days. Chris, if you would, go ahead and read verse 32. And command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year. And they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feasts. So what does that mean to you guys? 
Well, to me, is basically him just saying that these are the days that were given and we're not supposed to go in and disturb any of them to not, I guess, add any or subtract any. Yeah, and the opposite would be true, too. If we actually stopped counting the year as 364 days, then we would disturb the feasts and we would disturb the seasons. Right. I think it even says that in verse 33. If you would, Chris, go ahead and read that verse. But if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this order. And they will disturb the seasons and the years, and the years will be dislodged. And they will neglect their ordinances. That's right. So what is it saying? It's saying that... If they do disturb it, then their calendar will fall apart. Yeah, if we stop counting the year, it's 364 days. Just like you said, the calendar will fall apart. And then we won't know which season or which year that we're supposed to be in. Right, and read verse 34. And all the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years. And will forget the new moons and the seasons and the Sabbaths, and they will go wrong as to all order of the years. So, all of this as the result of stop counting the year as 364 days. So, here we see how important it is. We saw over there that Enoch kept telling us that the year was 364 days long. He really didn't go into detail as to why it was so important that. It was 364 days long. He just repeated it about 17 times. But over here we see Moses telling us the significance of being sure that the year is 364 days long. Right. But now were these guys crazy? Because when you look at the imperial evidence, it says that the year is 365 days long, right? Right. Chris, what does the scientists say the days are? They say it's 365 and a quarter days long. So did Enoch and Moses not know what they were talking about? Look over here in chapter 14 of the book called The Secrets of Enoch and read verse 1. And again, those men led me away to the western parts and showed me six great gates open corresponding to the eastern gates opposite to where the sun sets according to the number of the days, 365 and a quarter. So here it is, Enoch, who was before the Egyptians, before the Babylonians, before Moses, this was actually one of the first documents ever read, saying that the year is how long? 365 and a quarter. 365 and a quarter days. So the scientists try to act like they came up with that idea in Egypt or Babylon or somewhere. But all they had to do was read Enoch and they would have known that the year was 365 and a quarter days. But wait, he said a few minutes ago that it was 364 days. Right. Is he confused? Well, Enoch might not be confused, but I sure am because I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, I'm not very good at math, but my hearing is not so bad. But because you just said, Enoch said over 17 times that it was 364 days, but then Christian just read it was 365 days. And I'm like, okay, which one is true? Is he not crazy? <laughs> so, well, what's going on? What's going on here? Matter of fact, when we jump down to chapter 16, we see him say it again. If you would, Chris, read verse 3. And it goes through the western gates in the order and number of the eastern, and accomplishes the 365 and a quarter days of the solar year, while the lunar year has 364. So... Enoch is pretty squared away. He knows the exact timing of the moon. He knows the exact timing of the solar year. But over in the other books of Enoch, just like Moses was telling us that we're supposed to reckon the year being exactly 364 days. And we know that they weren't crazy. So how is it that they're both true? I don't know. I'm confused. 
So is the rest of the world on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have been confused on this subject. A lot of people have gone and, and used it in order to discredit the books of Enoch, to discredit the sacred calendar altogether, to create a lot of havoc because of the lack of understanding for these verses here and how it is possible that we could have a 364-day year. But I'm here to tell you that today, on this very day that our Father has allowed us to understand what this is actually talking about. And he didn't give this information by way of a dream or a prophecy or some type of vision or even some secret knowledge or some private interpretation. It's actually written in the scripture for us to see. We really just have to look at it. So you're saying that he wasn't necessarily hiding it. It's just that we haven't um, read it for ourselves. Right. We didn't do the research or we didn't do the work to find it. Exactly. Like we were talking about earlier, the imperial evidence points to a 365-day year. And because we are logical beings and because all of us have been to school, we believe that the year is supposed to have 364 days in it. Even when we look at our calendar, which I've done, and count those days out, it always ends up being 365 days. So it just hasn't made sense to us. And being logical beings, we have rejected the scriptural evidence and favored the empirical evidence because... That's what our eyes see. We see 365 days. Must be what's right. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we've chosen what man has given us as his answer rather than what the Father has presented us with as his answer. What we're going to find out here is that they're actually both right. First of all, let's come back over here to the book of Jubilees and let's look in chapter 6 because it holds one of the keys to understanding this 364 day year. You remember how it was telling us is that if we stop using the 364 day year that our years will become dislodged? Yeah, that was over in the um, words of Moses, yes. Yeah, and it says, and they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged. What does that mean to you that the years and the seasons will become dislodged? That means that we'll be following the jubilees on the wrong year and the feast in the wrong season. Exactly. You'll be celebrating a feast in the wrong season. If you don't remember the 364-day year, you will be celebrating the feast days in the wrong season. Now, to understand what it's talking about when it's talking about the seasons becoming dislodged, we have to understand that the earth has a wobble, that it wobbles on its axis. Have you ever heard that before? I have never heard of that. I've never heard that the earth has a wobble. I've heard of it every once in a while, but it doesn't come up very much. All right, let's watch a short video on the subject. The earth's axis of rotation, or the wobble effect. Let's begin by talking about the earth's axis. The Earth rotates on an axis. The axis is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees. The Earth rotates around its axis once a day. The tilt of the axis affects when seasons occur. When the axis tilts toward the Sun, the Northern Hemisphere experiences summer, while the Southern Hemisphere experiences winter. In half a year, the Earth will revolve elliptically counterclockwise around the Sun while the axis stays tilted at 23.5 degrees. When the axis tilts away from the sun, the northern hemisphere then experiences winter, and the southern hemisphere experiences summer. The axis of rotation, also known as the wobble effect. The Earth's axis has an axis of rotation, and, just like a top, the axis spins. The angle does not change, only the direction of the axis. The axis of rotation will complete a full cycle approximately every 26,000 years. Therefore, in 13,000 years, the occurrence of the seasons will be opposite than it is from this year. 
Therefore, in 13,000 years, the occurrence of the seasons will be opposite than it is from this year. After 26,000 years, the axis of rotation will have completed a full cycle and the occurrence of the seasons in the Earth's orbit will start over. In relation to the stars, the Earth's axis currently points toward the star Polaris. Due to the axis of rotation, the Earth's axis will be pointing somewhere near the star Vega in 13,000 years. All right, so did y'all hear that? Mm -hmm. It's saying that the Earth, it has a wobble. Just like the top. And did you hear that it says that in 26,000 years, the wobble will take a full effect and we'll be right back where we are in this season. But it said that halfway through that wobble period, 13,000 years, the seasons will be six months out. Did y'all notice that? Right. It's saying that the, that the seasons will be off by six months. The winter seasons will be in June and the summer seasons will be in December. What's the significance of that if the seasons are off? Then that means that basing it off of strictly 365 and a quarter will land you in having your whole year flipped upside down. And that is the key to the 364 day year. That's the purpose of it. That's what Enoch was talking about. That's what Moses is over here talking about. If we neglect the scripture that says that there's a 364 day year and only look at the empirical evidence which says that there's a 365 day year, it says that our seasons will be disturbed. The years will be disturbed or dislodged. We're going to lose track of the seasons. It says we're going to forget the new moons. We're going to forget the Sabbath days. And we're going to go completely wrong. Right. So it makes sense, right? Yeah, for me, for me, one of the things I'm thinking about, and you can tell me if this makes sense or not, or even if it's talking about this, is that by him saying that we'll forget the seasons, we will, uh, everything will be dislodged. Seems to me it's affecting about how the feast days, when the Father tells us to present a harvest, then, you know, if the seasons are messed up, we might not have a harvest to present. So I did the math here, and she's saying that in 13,000 years, the seasons will be opposite, where you would have the summer season falling in December and the winter season falling in June. So I did the math, 13,000 years divided by six months, that equals about 2,000 years per month. What that's saying is, is that if you go back to when the Messiah was crucified, he wouldn't have been crucified in the month of March. He would have actually been crucified in February. Right. And if you go back to Solomon's time, it would have been January. If you go back to Abraham's time, it would have been December. If you go back to Adam's time, you see what I mean? Right. So whereas Adam would have been celebrating the, the Passover in the month of November or December, now we're celebrating the Passover in April and March. So we will never be able to get it right. Without the 364 days, right. you won't be able to keep track of it. Right. So let's go over and let's look at how the 364 days work. So now I've done several classes coming out of this chapter, chapter 71 or chapter 72 of the book of Enoch, that which is called the book of the luminaries. But we're going to jump down here to verse 33 as it's talking about the 364 day year. If you would, Chris, would you read right there where it says verse 42 out of chapter 71? And at that period, the night becomes shortened. It is nine parts, and the night is equal with the day. 
Hold on. Now, what that's talking about is it's talking about the 12th cycle. By the time we get to this portion of the book of the luminaries, he's already described the six portals in which the sun travels through throughout the year. He started up there in a chapter 9 as he starts talking about the days becoming longer than the nights which would be the beginning of the yearly cycle. And now that he's down here at the end, he's saying that, that the nights are, have actually become equal one with another, and this is actually the end of the year. The year is precisely 364 days. So what he's saying is, is the day in which the night and the day becomes equal, that's the 364th day. Right. So that's how you calibrate your year. Every single year, you look at when the days and the nights become equal and call that the 364th day. And the next day will be what day? That will be the first day of the year. That will be the first day of the year, and that's what calibrates your year every single year. You will never get off track by doing that. That's the only way you're not going to get off track. Right, because of instead of calibrating your year off of, say, a clock, which is going to keep going even though it may be wrong, you're recalibrating every year so that you never get off track. You never get off track. Every single year, you're recalibrating the year. So this day and night where it happens at the same time, that only happens once every year? Twice in a year, in the spring and in the fall. With the difference being in the fall, the next day, the nights will be getting longer than the days. And when it happens in the spring, you see here, like in verse 13, how it's talking about the days actually get longer. If you would, read verse 13. During that period, the day is lengthened from the day, and the night is curtailed from the night for 30 days. So this right here is letting us know that we're in the spring. Like Chris says, it's going to happen twice a year when you have equal days and equal nights, which we know as the equal lux. But in the fall, it's the opposite where the days are getting longer. It's only in the spring when the days get longer after the equal lux. But now back down here at verse 42, he's telling us that the last day of the year is that day when the nights and the days become equal. So when you think about how this works, just for grins and giggles, we'll use January the 1st. If you start on January the 1st and you add 360 days to it, what do you end up at? You would end up at December the 31st. December the 31st, exactly. So when you look at it that way, the year actually has 364 days in it when you're only counting the days. You're counting January 1st as day one and December the 31st as day 364. Make sense? A little bit. Your logic is trying to creep in and mm -hmm. wanting to say no, there's 365 days in it, right? Right. But if you go 365 days from January 1st, where do you end up at? And you would have to end up back at January 1st. Back at January the 1st. So it's almost like you're counting January the 1st twice. Right. Right? So it even almost makes more sense that there's actually 364 days because you're not counting that day twice anymore. It's like the days of the week. There's seven days in a week, right? Right. And if you're standing on Sunday, counting Sunday as day one, and you count seven days, where do you end up? then you would end up Saturday. You end up on Saturday being day seven. Right. Right? But if you say that, say, a week later, then you end up on Sunday. Absolutely right. But it appears as though you've counted Sunday twice. And then you've actually counted eight days instead of seven. That is correct. Well, that's the same way with the 364-day year. When you start on day one, January the 1st, and you go 364 days, you end up on December the 31st. But, I will admit, that's not how Enoch actually intended for us to do it. 
It wasn't that he wanted us to count a continual 364 days like we were counting the years on the Gregorian calendar. The main reason for the 364 day calendar was to calibrate our year. So the 364-day calendar was to calibrate the 365-day calendar. Yeah, just like Enoch said over there in The Secrets of Enoch, the year is actually 365.25 days long. But the sacred year is 364. You're right by calling it the sacred year because by keeping up with the 364 days, it ensures that our feast days fall in the correct season. Now, there is one other reason why Enoch stressed the 364-day year, and that is for the celebration of the seasonal days. You ever seen on the Enoch calendar how you have 91 days in a season, like the months have 30, 30, and then 31 days? Yes, I've noticed that. Well, that 31st day is actually what they call a intercalary day, and it is actually supposed to be a day of remembrance, as if we are paying attention to when the seasons change every year. Taking a special day off just for that. And that we see up here in chapter 81. Read verse 5. With respect to the progress of the sun in heaven, it enters and goes out of each gate for 30 days with the leaders of the thousand classes of the stars with the four that are added and appertain to the four quarters of the year, which conduct themselves and accompany them at four periods. So what this is talking about is the division of the four seasons of the year. It's saying that each month has 30 days in it, but there is an additional day that we really need to consider. Read verse 6. Respecting these, men greatly err and do not calculate them in the calculation of every age. For they greatly err respecting them, nor do men know accurately that they are in the calculation of the year. Talking about these four additional days, you know, there's many people who will say there's 360 days in a year. They're not thinking about these four intercalary days, but we're seeing here how important it is to remember these days. But indeed, these are marked down forever. One in the first gate, one in the third, one in the fourth, and one in the sixth, so that the year is completed in 364 days. So here is how we're getting the 364 days. When you're thinking about each one of these months having 30 days in it, and we're not talking about a lunar month. This is just talking about the yearly calibration with these four extra days added in there. Now, what he goes on to say is that we're actually supposed to be celebrating these four additional days right here, remembering these days each year. So not only are we supposed to calibrate the year based on these 364 days, but we're actually supposed to stop, pause, and remember the different seasons as they come about, starting with the equilux going 30, 30, and then 31 days before we have a celebration as we get ready to enter summer. And then another 91 days as we get ready to go into the fall. Another 91 days when we get ready to enter the winter. And then the last 91 days before we get ready to enter spring. And he even goes on to name the angels that are over these seasons. But again, it's mainly for us to remember and never to forget these days at all. So, there you have it, the 364 days. What do you guys think? Well, for me, um, it's kind of exciting to know that, you know, everything that Scripture says is, uh, is right there available for us to uh, glean from it, that the Father actually put this information there for us, and how... He told us that if we do become, I guess, if we do go astray and we start messing up these seasons and days and Sabbaths and stuff, that this would happen. And I don't know, 
know, it's just amazing. Me sitting here listening to how the sun have his gates and how the angels are over the gates and each angel has been assigned a, 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 a gate. And I, I, it's, I don't know, it's just amazing. I'm sitting here just in awe of all the information that I'm hearing and, and how I'm thankful to be under the covering where I'm learning this stuff. So... I don't know. It's just amazing. I too am amazed. I'm I'm amazed that our father had the foresight to give us this key, this calibration period that will prevent us from, you know, getting off track. Because you know, when you do a search in the calendar, you can look back in about 1582 how man, you know, seemingly almost arbitrarily added 11 days to the calendar. Just to make it fit where he wanted to fit, I think his vernal equinox was, was off and falling on the wrong day, but he changed it so that it fell on March the 21st, and even since then, it's changed and now falls on March the 20th. So even with all their recalculating and trying to be precise with it, they're still not getting it right every year. And they're not going to get it right. They're going to keep having to recalibrate this thing. Every 500 years or so, we'll get a new calendar. But what does that say about the Father's calendar? So I have a question. Knowing this information, where do we go from there? A person who wants to observe the, um, the Father's sacred calendar, where do they go from there? How do they start? Well... The first thing you do with this information is you have more confidence in that calendar you have on the wall. When it tells you that you're in the Passover season or the tabernacle season, even though there are a lot of other conflicting YouTube channels and a lot of other voices that want to tell you that somehow these guys have gotten it wrong, you can look at the scripture where it points out that no we have a calibration day in here to tell us what season we're in these conflicting voices aren't speaking on the 364 days at all that's why they are a bit confused in their timing of the seasons and just like jubilee says they have dislodged their feast days and their years Low, lose some of them going as far as to lose track completely of the new moons, the seasons, and the Sabbath days, just like the scripture says. And then, once you understand those, then all you really need to do is go over to Leviticus in chapter 23 and see what it is that we're supposed to be doing in those seasons. Mingling all of that with a lot of prayer and meditation so our Father could get his way in and have his will done in our feast days and our celebrations and be ready to improve from there. Right. It's all about improving and getting better. Learning and applying. You're right. Okay, so in summary, let's see how all of this works. Now, we first have to understand that we're talking about two different kinds of years here. We're talking about the solar year and the sacred year. The way the solar year works is that the vernal equinox is actually the 364th day of the year. And the very next day is the first day of spring. That is when the sun will enter what's known as the fourth gate or the fourth portal. Then we'll count 30 days before the sun enters the fifth portal and another 30 days before it enters the sixth portal. And the next month would have also 31 days in it. But that 31st day, which falls around the summer solstice, would be a day of remembrance. That is the first of the four days that makes up the 364 day year. And then we'll keep progressing around the calendar as such. 30 days, then 30 days, then 31 days, until you have another day of remembrance. Then 30, 30, and 31 days, which will fall around the winter solstice. And then 30, 30, and 31 days, which will bring us back to the spring equinox, the 364th day, 
and the last day of the solar year. That's how the calendar is calibrated. Now, when it comes to the sacred year, or that year in which we determine the festival days, it is only after that calibration day, after the vernal equinox, do we start looking for the new moon to fall. The first new moon after the vernal equinox will be the first month and the first day of the sacred year. And from there, we'll start looking for the feast days like Passover and unleavened bread. And we'll keep up with those holy convocations all year long until we get around to the 12th month. And after that 12th month, when that new moon falls, the question then becomes, does that new moon fall before the vernal equinox or after the vernal equinox? If it falls after the vernal equinox, then we know that we will be in the new sacred year, the month Nisan or Abib. But if that new moon falls before the vernal equinox, then we know that we have a 13th month in that year. And that new moon that just fell before the vernal equinox will be the first day of that 13th month. And the month after that will be the month Abib or Nisan. All right. Well, I think that closes the door or maybe it just opens the door on a 364 day calendar. But I believe this is it. You guys, if y'all disagree or if you agree, whatever your comments are, please leave them down in the comment section of this video. And if you got anything out of the video, hit the like button. Make sure you hit that bell notification button and that subscription button just in case we do have to come back in and address this subject in the future. You'll see when those classes come out. And I think that's that on that. All right. Shalom. Shalom.